Cool. Um, yeah, like I always mentioned, if you have any questions, you know, don't hesitate, just ask them straight away. Um, about having, you know, silly questions or anything like that, my strong belief is there's no such thing as, you know, stupid questions or silly questions or unimportant questions. Everyone understands information differently. So the fact that I'm presenting in a certain way doesn't mean that everyone will understand information the same way, right? So if you have some uh, on clarifications, you know, you need me to showcase something once again, just to make sure that you understood it. That's not a problem. That's why we have these meetups. And yeah, this is a, more of a discussion, right? I'm here to showcase to you. But if you do have any cases or you have some questions, feel free to jump in, ask them, and I'll try to cover them as, as good as I can. All right. Yeah, and how um, to do that, yeah. sorry, and how to do it, unmute yourself, say, uh -uh, and start speaking, or write in the chat, uh, and, uh, and then we will look at it. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. So the topic for today is how to build reports like applications, right? This is one of the main kind of criteria when it comes to report building, because we're transitioning and starting to work in a world that tries to transfer from the traditional style of reporting, where we have, you know, printed out PDFs, massive amounts of Excel sheets that we try to analyze or anything like that. Power BI allows us to take that all information and actually create a report that supports more of a Q&A session type of thing, right? We start off with an overview, we have different dimensions, we filter them out. Essentially, for example, if I go out of the report, let's say just a simple example right here, right? We have three different visuals. I use the visuals to slice and dice through the information. Oh, I forgot to turn off the interactions, there we go. So I can use different visuals to filter out the information and look at what's really important to me at this particular time. Now, in order to support these things, we also need to think about how to navigate through the report, what elements can be used within it. Are there maybe you know, unique use cases for bookmarks and so forth? So those, that's the main thing that we are gonna try to cover today. Primarily, what I'm gonna try to focus on is gonna be um, apps versus reports. That's the first thing. I'm gonna briefly cover what are apps and why are they important to even think about. Then it's gonna be regarding our layouts info overlays that you can create within the reports, visual switches and dynamic visual titles. Now these are gonna be the five main points for today. If there are more points that you want me or all this to cover, you know, let us know about it. We can easily create a second meetup at some certain time. All right, so the first one is apps versus reports, right? Why is that really important to actually understand where are you gonna be building your report? Uh, the main reason for that is because it really going to affect the navigation story that you're going to have. So, for example, just in the, um, a simple example, right? If we open up a report within the Power BI services, we typically have this side navigation panel with the pages that we can switch between. If we go in the same report, open up a full screen, we have the navigation pages right here at the left, bottom kind of uh, the bottom part of the report. Now, if we use the same report and actually build an app with it, the view is also going to be a completely different. I forgot this one. Let's see, I think it was this one. Let's go here. There we go. Apps, Power BI. So for the apps, you can see there's a different layout, right? We have this side panel specifically for navigation. Whereas, for example, if you create reports and then you publish them on the online services for everyone to view, you're gonna get the navigation pages here. So every single scenario has essentially a different layout for the navigation. And what's really important for you when you are building these reports is to have some sort of a consistency between them and to allow the user to easily follow through with different pages and understand where exactly everything is located. Now, this is one of the main reasons why I try to emphasize it as much as possible. Whenever you're trying to build a report, don't forget that it's a two-way street, right? You have to talk with the actual end users. You have to ask them what are gonna be the main KPIs, what visuals would they like, how do they feel about the report. Don't try to spend, let's say, you know, six, nine, 10 day or a couple of days building a report, then presenting to them and understanding, okay, they actually can't find anything within it. Even the smallest changes can make a lot of impact on how the user perceives the information and how he feels about the navigation within it. Uh, so yeah. Main reason why I wanted to quickly cover the apps and the reports is just think about the actual kind of pad that you're gonna be using to provide the reports for the end user. If it's just gonna be a report, take in consideration that, for example, if you publish the web, this is gonna be the layout. If you use just a simple report, for example, if you do right here, 
let's go for this one is going to be more of a this sort of view if you use an app version it's going to be again a different view so make sure you take that into consideration now the next thing is going to be regarding the layouts now when it comes to layouts this is really important thing about the reports the main reason why you do want to have different layouts is because it helps you to have again the consistency within the report this helps you to understand and provide information to the user in a simple and understandable manner. You can see, for example, in these images, we have different KPIs at the top. They could be at the top, they could be on one of the sides. You can define how the layout looks like. Now, when it comes to the layouts themselves, there are a few resources that are really good for these things. One of them is Power BI Tips. So Power BI Tips. Let me quickly load that up. And here under tools, you can open up layouts. Now they have some free layouts, they have some layouts that they charge for, but essentially you can find at least some basic layouts that can help you to create really amazing reports. And one of the best things is that these layouts are not just you know placeholders, they're actually provided to you as a template file. So if you wanna use the same principles, you can easily download the, the sample file yourself, open it up and it's gonna be a PBX file, right? So for example, I have it right here. So essentially you have all the core elements already there for you and you can save a lot of time by using these templates. You can even create your own templates. So for example, if we go here, we can see that on this one, we have page navigation here on the left side. So once we switch between pages, the visuals change, but the essential elements always stay the same. So they, in this case, they sort of have a, a border across the report. On the right hand side, we actually have an additional slicer panel, which we can open up to filter even further on. So these things really help the user to kind of get acquainted and get familiar with the layout of the report. So they know where to look for that key information, right? As far as, so for example, you can use that to find some resources. Another great way on how to find, for example, I typically go through that as well to kind of get an inspiration, for example, for different layouts, different ideas of how to visualize data, what kind of reports they create and so forth, is actually the community of Power BI. And under the community section, there are data stories. Feel free to just open any of them up. These are all publicly accessible. You can open them up, play around with them. And if you really want to, you can easily, in most of the cases, well, for example, we can try it out actually. Let's open up this one. And in a lot of these cases, you have images available. In some of the cases you have the PBIX is already available. And the third option is, of course, you can leave a comment so that the actual owner of the report sends you the report to kind of test it out. Um, we also have submitted a couple of ideas here in the data stories from the reports that we have built over the time. And if somebody reaches out to us asking for the sample files, you know, have nothing against it. You can easily just get it from me. I can send you a copy, use it, see how our things set up. Because at the end of the day, what I'm really interested in is helping the community to understand how to visualize data in a better manner. So these two resources are really great. Of course, you can also look for inspirations in different YouTube channels. So for example, Kerbal.com, uh, Guy in a Cube from time to time covers interesting cases on how to use elements uh, to do certain things for you. So those, that goes for that. Um, what else you can do? Of course, you can always try to build your own template. Now, when you're building your own template, I would say it goes into two parts, right? One of the ways on how you can do this is by actually creating something really simple within a PowerPoint presentation itself or a Word document or just a, you know, um, an Excel sheet or whatever, wherever you can afterwards can take a picture. So for example, if you know that the case that you are gonna be covering is gonna be relatively simple and the layout that you need isn't something really complex, right? So for example, you just have a basic layout like I have here. I have a title, few visuals, few KPIs, and afterwards I decide, okay, I actually wanna kind of start to do and create a different layout, right? I can delete the overlay that I had there and start to work with each of the elements. And I can decide, okay, actually, instead of having three elements right here, I'm just gonna delete these two increase the size of them, sort of have a side panel right here. The title is not really necessary. I'm kind of gonna have only four main elements, right? That's what I'm gonna be focusing on. Let's just increase the size of this one. Oh, wrong arrow. Come on, okay, a little bit of straw there. 
So once you create a report, easiest thing to do is just hit print screen or open up snipping tool. I'm using a, a software called Lightshot. So I can just click, mark an area, add more markers or anything like that, save it on top of, on my screen layout, let's say edited. And now I can open up my Power BI reports, right? So I open up a report. Here we have a completely blank page. What I do is I open up page formatting options, open up page backgrounds, add image, and load the image that I just created for the layout. Like I said, this is for really basic use cases, right? Oh, to decrease the transparency, otherwise it's not visible. Now, one thing that kind of might freak you out a little bit in the beginning <laughs> is every single image has different properties or different, let's say, scaling models that are used for the image. Right now it's using the normal size. So you can see, I don't even see half of the elements I had there. So just make sure you use, for example, fit. This allows the image to be fitted within the page that you have there. So now that once we have these pages right here, we can start to actually work on the visuals themselves. So for example, we can take a donut visual, add it right here. Here I'm gonna say, for example, uh, let's go for product line and sales. Something really simple, right? There we go, we have a donut visual here. Now here, what we can do is, let's say for this one, I'm gonna be using a combo visual, well, which is essentially a column chart. For this one, I'm gonna go for something a little bit different. And I'm gonna say that where we had it, we have territories and we have countries. There we go. And I'm also gonna be using sales for the series. We have column chart. And here, since it's a longer time period, this actually looks like a really nice place for to have a time series visual to kind of look over the changes over time. So I'm gonna add a time series visual right here, add in a date field, and again, the sales that we were using. Perfect. Here, we can make some basic cards to kind of use as our main KPI block. So there we go. Let's just copy paste a couple of them. Just like that. In order to kind of spread them out, there's also a really good feature within the Power BI itself. So as long as you mark all the elements, you can click here and format, align, and align vertically. This allows you, this kind of spreads them automatically so that every single distance between them is the same. This allows you to kind of have a more consistent approach between them, let's say like that. And then afterwards, what we're gonna do is we're gonna use our basic elements. So we know we are looking at sales across all these report, all these visuals, right? So we're gonna be using sales for the first one. Uh -huh. We see one more thing, and that's to adjust the size of the labels. Once we have that, or actually we can leave them and use another feature. There we go. So we can have our sales metrics right here. Afterwards, we're gonna add, for example, let's see what we else had. We have profit, we have order numbers now, we have quantities. And the fourth one is gonna be the cost. Just four different metrics, right? Cost 75, okay, weird data set, but sure. <laughs> So what we're gonna do here is I accidentally did it wrong. So we're gonna adjust the data labels and say that this is, for example, 24 font sizes. And now we're gonna use the format painter. So click on the element you wanna copy the format from and click on the new items you wanna convert. So this just allows you, it's a lot faster than going to the formatting options for all the visuals, trust me. <laughs> So, and just like that, we essentially have created a layout, we have added our visuals, and this looks already a little bit more professional. Now, of course, an alternative for this is to create everything within Power BI. One of the reasons why in certain scenarios that is the best approach, but not always. Like I said, if you have really basic requirements, adding just an image is gonna work for, for you a lot better than trying to do this with elements from Power BI. Because when you have a lot of elements, for example, we have this report, right? So if I go to format, edit interactions, and as soon as I click on one of the visuals, you can see there's just a bunch of elements. And as soon as you have them starting to overlay or being on top of another, being used as reference points or something like that, you're having more and more visual elements on the report page. Now that loads up your resources. Whereas if you just have a background image, one thing is that you're always gonna be able to just click on the 
the visuals itself. So for example, you can see if I move the visual, I can click around. It doesn't kind of open up the container or activate the container. That's because that's an image, right? Whereas if it would be just an element, you have the option of accidentally just pressing on it and selecting it, moving it, resizing it. So there's a few other options that, if not options, but kind of problems that come with it. The other added benefit from it, on the other hand, is that the native into, sorry, the native buttons that, for example, Power BI has, offers few more options when it comes to customization. So for example, you can define the default states for the buttons. Actually, we can quickly do that right here, right? I, I wish. Yeah. Sorry, we have a question. Could you look yeah. at chat? It seems you can. Mm -hmm. No, that, uh, John, that is correct. But an easy way to kind of go around it is actually if you have an element that you want to copy between the pages, right? So that's the formatting that you're going to copy. Just simply copy one element one time so that the element is there because this one is going to keep all the formatting options. Remember, when you copy a visual, every single setting that you have set in the formatting options is also going to be copied. And now if I just, for example, already had, let's say, different other KPIs with different metrics, I can use the same date, sorry, format picker to copy and paste the formatting. Now, across the reports, it's essentially the same thing. Copy the visual, not the format initially. So if I copy this one right here, and as long as I have the same data, for example, or the same properties, let's go in this report. And let's say, I'm just gonna delete this one to kind of clear up a little bit of room. I'm gonna disable interactions, otherwise, Loading up all those icons takes a while. As you can see right here, that's because I don't have the same field, right? But if I, let's say, for example, put in a deal size, the formatting options are kept from that previous report. And now once we have it here, I can use the format painter and apply this to every single other visual that's out there. So essentially there is an option, it's just that you first need to copy the visual and then use the format painter. Yeah, happy I could help. <laughs> All right. Now we started off, we left actually at buttons, right? So the next thing is going to be regarding the buttons. For example, for the buttons, the reason why I said that the native visual does offer a few more options when trying to build, let's say, layouts with the built in elements is you do have these shapes right here as well. The added benefit of it is, for example, if you do create elements that need to be, let's say, a little bit more dynamic, so you're using these elements for page navigation or something like that, you can essentially have the same element copy pasted. But when you use or hover over it, it actually can have multiple kind of behaviors. So for example, you can see right now, if I open up the fill color, it's by default, it stays here by default state, right? So I'm not doing anything with the visual. So just to kind of see a little bit better the difference, I'm gonna add a fill color of blue. And for this one, I'm actually gonna copy the same button. Let's do it like that. Let's copy the same button. And for this one, I'm also gonna go here, but instead of default state, I'm gonna choose on hover, for example, and change the color to be a little bit pinkish. So now you see, for example, on this one, we didn't set the state in different formats. Whereas on this one, as soon as you hover over it, it gets sort of a highlight for it. And all these, trust me, all these small nuances and details are either gonna help you with your reports or just increase, let's say, the adaption rate. And that's why you need to communicate with your users to understand how technical are they, you know, what helps them to understand the visual. What, is it better to use textual buttons? Is it better to use icons for references? Because your job as a report creator, where you know when you are building the reports, is to kind of accommodate the needs of the actual end user. There's no reason to create a report which technically provides everything that they ask kind of ask you to provide, but at the same time, nobody is using it because it's really hard to read. It's not intuitive. It's just you know it's there, but nobody really uses it. Try to avoid these situations. All right, so you can either use pictures or you can create your own layouts. Now, the third option that you can actually do with the built-in items is, for example, to create, let's say, an overlay that opens up on top of the visuals. 
And what I mean by that is, for example, if we open up this page right here, I have created these two bookmarks, right? And once I use the bookmarks, for example, if I right click, because I'm using a Power BI desktop, you know that in order to use a bookmark, I need to hold down control and then I click on the item. So what I can do here is essentially control click on a bookmark, which calls out an overlay. And on top of it, I added a GIF, right? And you can do this with multiple elements. You can, for example, under that informational button, provide, for example, who developed the report, when was it last updated? You can add visuals underneath it. So use that, for example, to store more information on the same report page without taking the real estate. Because when you're building reports, the let's say the real estate is one of those premium capacities which you don't weigh, have a way of increasing. Unless you just increase the size of the report, but let's be honest, don't do that if it's not really necessary. So for example, we have a GIF right here. Then what I'm really doing here is, for example, I can switch between different GIFs on the same overlay, and then I can close the overlay. Now, the reason why I built two buttons right here is because bookmarks essentially also have more properties that you can utilize from them. So for example, if I open up bookmark selection panes, these two panels right here, you, have, you see that I have created multiple groups right here. So this just helps me to understand which elements are where so I can afterwards find the necessary information. Um, when it comes to naming the elements, one thing you need to uh, take into consideration is that the name that you provide for the elements right here on the selection pane is gonna be used within the title itself. So for example, right here, if I choose this donut visual, you can see it's named sales by territory, right? And that's the name that's displayed also here. Now, if I rename it right here, oops, I said the wrong click. Let's go like this, just a donut. See, the name also shows up here. So just make sure that if you are using the original titles for the visuals, make sure you don't really adjust these names for the visuals too much. Now, when it comes to bookmarks, these elements are really specific ones. So whenever you're creating multiple bookmarks, for example, on one page, provide as much descriptive information within the name so you can afterwards find them easily. And you can also group them. For example, when I started out, um, I didn't fully understand this concept. And what I did is, for example, I didn't understand how to group things, right? It kind of helps a lot already. But at the same time, if you have the same name for every single element, the problem that comes afterwards is when you choose a bookmark and choose an action for it, every single name is gonna be the same. So the names that you are providing right here are always gonna be right here as well. So just make sure that those names are, let's say, in a way that you can understand and find the right one. So we can quickly close that. And the other uh, thing that I want to uh, add... One, uh, can I ask a question, please? Sure, yeah. sure. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I have experience with bookmarks a lot as well, and uh, I found it uh, very hard to to make it uh, like a, a cross book bookmarking. For example, you have two bookmarks here. For example, mm -hmm. if you have uh, like a, a menu of two, and then uh, another two, for example, which switches like one mm -hmm. layout to another layout, it's like it gets like like to multiply. It's like uh, you have to have four combinations of bookmarks already there, and like. Uh, uh, hiding and unhiding of uh, these buttons that you want to say switch into. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you know if in, there's any like better method because the, like two by two is, is still doable but if you do like two by three it's already impossible almost. <laughs> yeah. do, you, do you know uh, what I mean? <laughs> no no I get it yeah I've come across this situation myself as well so I ended up instead of using just four bookmarks ended up with using I think it was uh, roughly around 30 or 40 of them. <laughs> so no, that should it should be some. Uh, let's say uh, I expect that Microsoft will do some uh, native like menu type of a uh, uh, functioning thing uh, that could could like ease up all these bookmarking stuff because it's like a good stuff but it's not like fully functional. So yeah, I get it. Um, that's why we have the ideas portal. So if you have ideas, feel free to write them and always vote for them. I encourage everyone else to vote them. I know there are some ideas that have been there for quite a while, let's say like that, and still haven't been implemented. But it's the same as, for example, developing our visuals, right? Without knowing the actual feedback, we don't know that there is a problem. 
So if whenever there is a problem, always make sure that the, um, you know, the developers know about it. That's one thing. The other thing when it comes to bookmarks and different, let's say, hiding elements, switching elements, switching layouts and so forth is to understand, is it, well, first point is, is it really necessary to do this within one singular page, right? Because in some certain scenarios, I do understand that, for example, you just, let's say, a quick example would be if I just use a switch function, either a switch function or two bookmarks to switch between two different visual states, right? For example, instead of a donut, I want to use a combo visual. I'm going to show that as well afterwards. Yeah. Um, one primary goal that you have with this is to make sure that the layers that you create with the bookmarks, like you said, they cross over each other, right? Yeah. Your main goal when you're creating a report is to try to not cross over them. So if it is necessary for you to navigate to a different page, do that. Because otherwise, when you are creating, so for example, in my instance, we ended up with those 40 bookmarks. The main problem that I had afterwards is the report was doing exactly what the customer wanted to do. But the problem was the performance. And that's mainly because you're still loading up every single element in the background, right? If you divide them into separate pages, because let's be honest, the user doesn't necessarily notice if you open up an overlay or if you switch to a new page. For a moment, it feels the same. And if you apply, you know, more creative thinking on how to animate that transition or, you know, make it as smooth as possible, you can create these cases or let's say increase the performance of the cases so much that the user is even accepting those cases. Okay, let's just split the bookmarks into two different pages because it makes more sense when the full performance is great. Otherwise, you know, you have the interactions and everything, but the full performance is just killing everything else. Yeah, I, I agree. I agree to that, and uh, and that it seems seems so that uh, it's better to choose another solution because it's sometimes being like you have this main menu, uh, maybe some subsets there, and then uh, then you have this one you say you just want to switch over visual like representation, and then some other combination of that so that what what yeah. uh, is represented there then it actually gets awkward because. But anyway, it's been uh, part of the solution is there that you can give an option to a uh, user to change the layout of the visual themselves. So, so this is a new feature recently. Was yeah, the, that's the one that was there. added yeah, with the yeah. August release. All right, thank you for a comment. So it's all right. <laughs> Sorry. Um, on the other hand, for example, if you do have a lot of these elements, let's say, if you in incorporate them as part of the actual solution itself, right? Because for example, we have just a tremendous amount of bookmarks right here. Adding every single one of them on a single layer would be hard for the user. But even in this report, when you switch between the pages, the panels stay the same. So the user kind of experience doesn't change, but they have more pages and more underlying pages. Whereas in reality, if you look at this, we only have five pages, right? So we only are going through these five elements. All these tabs right here are essentially just switching the visuals. So this is kind of one of ways on how to work around it as well. But yeah, main, main thing is make sure that the performance doesn't suffer because of the amount of bookmarks that you create. All right, um, one more reason why when I covered this one at the beginning was the reason why I have two bookmarks right here is because bookmarks have, when you right click on them, they actually have additional properties within them. So you can choose whether or not the bookmark is transitioning also, the, the, the applied filters for the data, the visual changes, if it's the current page, if it's just a particular visual or all visuals. And you can see this, for example, in this case, right? So if I choose one particular slice in the donut visual, and then I open up the info overlay, so I actually want to know how to use the visual. Okay, I go through one tip, I go through the other tip. Okay, fine, I understand it. I close the overlay, but the filters are gone. If, that's the, if that case is completely suitable for the end user, sure, that's easy to fix. It's not really a problem. The other way is, for example, if you use the same bookmarks, for example, you can see right here, the only difference is I uncheck the data part of it. So what really happens here is, for example, when I choose that one particular slice, I can open up the bookmark, I can go through the tabs itself, close them, and you can see the filters where the selection is exactly the same. So this is one of those things that kind of helps you to navigate through everything while still keeping the context relevant. So this is also one of those things that you do need to pay attention when creating, for example, overlays or bookmarks is the state of the visuals. Um, so one way on how, for example, we are kind of trying to 
let's say, increase the adaption rate for the visuals is, for example, if we use, let's say, our donut visual, one thing that we did here is we added in, within the toolbar a separate reset button. Now, typically within the reports, you'll find there's usually a master reset, right? Which kind of clears out all the filters. But this reset button that we added for the visuals just allows you to clear the, the filters just from that one particular visual. So, and that in combination with the bookmarks can work quite well. Um, okay, reading the question. I have a measures formatted one way, but sometimes want to use them in a different format. For example, I may have a measure as percent with two decimal places. I use it with two decimal places in one visual, but then want to no decimals in another. Any tips on how to do this efficiently? Ha, 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 ha. Hmm. Depends on the actual visuals that you're trying to use there, I'd say that's one of them. Typically what I've seen uh, other BI users do is, for example, to create a separate calculated form, calculated column where you just define a format. So you use a format function. Um, a different way is, for example, if those visuals can be covered by our visuals, one of the greatest things that we have added, which I'm really kind of proud of, <laughs> is these two settings right here, which kind of you are referring to, right? So if you wanna change the format of the value, so let's say I just, a little bit of off topic, but hey, it might work some for somebody else as well. So for example, right now, you can see that I have values with two decimal numbers. These two settings right here within the visual, so value decimals and percentage decimals, allow you to define how it's gonna look like on per visual basis, the, the thing that you are looking for, right? Without changing the default data model, I can say, okay, but in this visual, I actually wanna force that the value decimals are gonna be zero and percentages, let's, for some reason, I want four of them. And because we're using two different elements regarding the detail labels and the tooltips, you can actually see here one format, but if I hover over the tooltip, it showcases you the default value format. So this is one way on how we, we personally handle these. So, and I have an idea on how to handle this, but unfortunately when it comes to native visuals, I'm not an expert on how to handle these cases because in those cases I typically use our visuals. <laughs> Makes kind of sense, right? I do work for them. <laughs> All right, um, so we covered these cases with the overlays and the overlays can be different things. Like I said, it can be just an informational pop-up that describes who developed the report, what are the main aspects, how to interact with it. You can use GIFs. Uh, regarding GIFs, it's actually a, a quite funny story, for example. So in order to actually get a working GIF within a Power BI, it's not really that simple. Because first thing you kind of try to do is go to insert. A GIF is still an image, right? It's an image format. So you go here, for example, and say, Let's go here. Let's find the GIFs. Images. No. I had it open just a while ago. Okay, I can forget about it. Uh, so here, images. GIFs 2020. Yeah, there we go. So for example, if I add an image, it's still going to be just a static image, right? It's going to load up that snapshot for one particular moment. A workaround for this is something I've learned from Andre Lefagne. He's the owner of Zebra BI Visuals. So they are also with data visualization. And a workaround for this is quite funny in, in a way. What you need to do is add, for example, a clustered column chart. <clears throat> what you add, need to do afterwards is add a little bit of data. Because right now you can see I have no formatting options because the visual is not active. In order to customize it, I need to activate it. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna use, for example, deal size and put it in the tooltip. Since I don't have the actual visual, I really don't have a tooltip. So there's no problem with that. But now I have access to all the formatting options. In the formatting options, I need to open up plot area and add image right here. And in this case, what's gonna really happen is I get a working GIF. I don't know why it is like that. I don't know why Power BI just didn't kind of allow you to add GIFs in the first place without using external visuals that are not security certified or anything like that. But hey, there is a workaround for it. Use a custom, use just a visual and use the GIF as a plot area for the visual. And the same principle applies, choose how to want to fill it within the say, the, let's say the uh, visual container. 
So yeah, trust me, when I learned about this, I was like, God damn. <laughs> Because I was trying to figure out a way on how to add GIFs to the visuals. And I was stuck there. I couldn't find a way. Thanks to Andre, I was able to figure it out and finally do some certain things with the reports that I was kind of looking forward to. Essentially, why I was looking forward to it is to do something similar that we have done right here. So that I created, for example, right here, where whereas you sort of have an instructional guide for the visual, right, or for the report. So the report, the report that I built for the customer, they essentially have this informational button where once you click on it, it opens up a whole path of different tips and tricks for the report to get more acquainted with it. So you know how to use it, you know what the visual, the, what the report is actually representing, what are the dimensions used there and so forth. So GIFs are really powerful when used properly, I would say like that. So that goes for that. Um, no, we don't want to delete it now. The next thing that I wanted to quickly cover as well is actually on how to use bookmarks as well, but to use them as switches for the visuals. So for example, if we go right here, we can add two buttons, right? I'm going to add two blank buttons. I'm actually going to close these ones right now since I don't need them right now. And also so you can actually see something, right? I'm going to copy these two right here. And I'm also going to copy two more elements. I'm going to position them like this right now because it's just for the demo sample. In reality, you would probably place them exactly where the other one is so that they kind of interchange between each other. Now, the next step is I'm going to name the elements. So I'm going to say this one is donut on. Click on this one, find a button. This one is donut off. This is going to be combo on. And this one is going to be combo off. There we go. Now we need the visualization screen. And what I'm going to do here is just add text to it. So just donut. Same thing. Donut. Combo. Almost, close enough. <laughs> Let's choose this one as well. And say this is also a combo. So there we go. We have the four elements that we have right now. Now, the next thing is I want to define the default state on how it looks like. The reason why I want to do this, I essentially want to create effect of, you know, how it's turned off and on. So the user understands which one is being used and which one is being not used. So the default state that we saw before, I'm gonna actually use the fill color for this default state and the fill color for used ones is gonna be, let's say, yellow. And the turn off color is gonna be pinkish. Yep, there we go, pink one. So these ones are on, these ones are off. So what I'm essentially gonna be doing is creating two new bookmarks. And for this visual, I'm also gonna create another copy There we go, I accidentally click, click too much. Okay, and we're gonna convert this one to be, for example, just a column chart. Right now it looks kind of weird because they're on top of each other, but that's completely fine because we're gonna hide and show some certain elements. Plus minus I positioned it. And this one, we definitely know this, and this is not a combo visual, this is a column column combo or um, so first things first we're gonna create the the initial state right so we're gonna use bookmark three for that and for the bookmark three what I want to achieve is I want to see the donut visual I want to see the donut on button and the combo off button so what I'm gonna do is hide the column visual right here I don't need that for this particular instance then I don't need the combo on because it's not gonna be on and for the donut, I don't need the donut off button. Oh, it's switched on. Okay, mixed up. Sorry. So this is on. This is going to be off. Yes. Yeah, happens as well. Yeah, there we go. And now donut off is like this. 
And this is gonna be my initial state, right? So I update the bookmark. And the other behavior that I want to create here is gonna be in reverse. So I actually wanna see the column chart. I don't wanna see the, the donut that I had initially. So I'm gonna hide that. When it comes to buttons, for the buttons, I wanna see the donut off I don't wanna see. I just wanna see combo off, see combo on, disable donut on update the bookmarks. So essentially now, when I'm switching between the bookmarks right now, and these states can be afterwards used through the actions as well. But essentially when I'm switching and using the bookmarks, you can see I can switch between one or another visual. And this can be used also in different other applications. So for example, one way on how this has been used for, let's say reports that are still relatively small, not too complex, uh, you can use the same principle not only to change the visuals but also to change for example the metrics being used so for example in one visual you previously had the amount of sales whereas if you press the button you get the count of sales so these sort of scenarios but those cases can also be covered with a measure i'd say it really depends on the use case to see which one works better for you there's certain applications for bookmarks and certain applications for the switch function So we went through that. Uh, what else we have regarding the bookmarks? There's different applications on what you can do with them and different layouts that you can create with them. These are, for example, some of the samples that we have available as well. So for example, you can see that in this case, we have the page navigation right here, but let's be honest, if you see a report like this, this is the last place where you're gonna be looking at, right? First one is gonna be the top row. So what the creator did here, he actually hid everything nice and nicely within the environment that he created. You can see right here, if you hover over, it says click to open navigation menu. Once you click on it, it opens up the pages that you have within the report. So for example, I can choose, let's say, what if analysis is gonna go to that page. And now when I open up the navigational pane, you can see that this one's highlighted and the user can understand exactly where he's located at. So there are different applications, different ways and different kind of, so let's say, use cases that you can achieve with this. Um, the main kind of limitation typically is just the creativity. Or one of the main things that, for example, I was struggling at first is I was also afraid to kind of ask for support, right? Because I thought, I mean, come on, I'm working with visuals. I work with decent companies. Those customers, those companies are paying a decent amount to, for our services. So how does it look like if I just ask questions and ask for help? But thanks to the community, thanks to the, there's different Facebook groups and everything. During the meetups as well, I've learned a lot of things. Uh, the community is there to help you. Nobody is gonna judge you. Typically, the only thing that that is not, let's say, <laughs> typically supported is if you have a question and you haven't even you know, had the decency to Google it. 90% of the questions have already been answered. Certain cases are still probably not going to be answered. But the least you could do is just try to Google it, see if somebody has answered it. If you can't find an answer, if you post it in the Facebook groups or the community post, somebody will help you. That's not a problem. Everyone is there to support each other. That's one of the interesting things about actually our BI community. I haven't seen this with other BI tools, to be fair. <laughs> So yeah, this is one of the navigational idea. Uh, another sample, for example, what you can do with this is, like I said, for example, in this one, where you just store them in different tabs and kind of have a little bit easier approach, right? Um, at the same time, for example, with the overlays that we created, also we can create these, for example, these sort of cases where you use the overlay, for example, you can see here, analysis of sales funnel. We don't have that information right here, but once we click on it, the text is essentially used as an active uh, action button. Once I click on it, it has an overlay for it. It opens up an actual visual, not just informational blocks. And right here, we actually have an information button even. So there's different cases, different utilizations and how you can achieve these things. If you have certain ideas and just struggling to figure out on how to actually achieve it, like I said, write about it in the community post. Um, feel free to reach out to me as well. If I have the time, I'm more than willing to support these cases and try to, let's say, struggle with you together to find out the way how to solve this. Uh, but the main thing is also when you're do trying to, um, let's say, describe the case, be as descriptive as possible. If you have some mock-ups of screenshots, if you even draw something with just hand, 
to help the other side, let's say, understand what you are actually trying to achieve there. So yeah, this is another case that you can use. Um, can this one, no, here, no, that's it. I think I closed accidentally one more report. Yeah, closed one more, doesn't matter. So yeah, different cases on how you can use them. Now, a really simple thing, but something you still a lot of users are struggling with is, for example, a little bit more dynamic approach when you're working with titles. Uh, when you're working with titles, the main part of it is you want them to represent the actual selections and the values that have been passed through, right? So one of the things that I typically recommend you to do, for example, is let's say something similar to what had been done in pop up, go down. I have the zoom control, so that's why I'm just hovering up and down. <laughs> is actually, for example, use different states for the buttons, right? So for example, you can see that we have a placeholder right here but there's nothing really there at the moment. The text that appears there is only called out when you use an actual filter from the visuals. So for example, you can just have a placeholder there so that the design doesn't change, but actually provide text to it when the actual filters are applied and when the button is actually meaning, let's say meaningful to press. The other thing when you are working with titles is like I said, you want to have them dynamic. So what you can do in order to achieve that is use measures as the titles for you. So for example, you can see here we had sample sales report, right? Whereas if I start to filter out things, I do get this information, it is filtered out, but the title is not gonna change because that's just a regular textual block. In order to create something a little bit more meaningful, we're gonna use measures for that. So we're gonna delete this one. And we are going to open up this right here. So first things first, we're going to see what fields do we have within the donut chart. So the main one is territory, all right? And the combo visual, we have product line. Okay, so territory and product line. I already had these measures created, but we can actually just delete them because creating them is not that difficult. So we're going to create everything from scratch. Let's just delete them. There we go. So what are we gonna do is first, we're gonna add a card, always add a card. It helps you to afterwards test the measure. And I'm gonna have it in the title anyways. So I'm just gonna keep it there for a while. Now I'm gonna create a new measure. The measure I'm gonna use is really simple. It's called selected value. What essentially you do there is you define, since I'm gonna be using this for the donut initially, I'm gonna say that this is the territory measure Dirty. almost again, Dirty. Dirty. it's been a long day. Territory, and the formula is selected value. And here, what you do is you provide the column from which you are gonna return to selected value. In this case, again, territory. There we go, add a comma, and then we add, add some generic text. So essentially, alternate result means if none, nothing is selected, this is the text that's gonna be shown. In my case, I'm gonna say all uh, let's just say all regions, territories is not in my vocabulary today. <laughs> there we go. So that's one of them. The second one is gonna be regarding the product line. So again, new measure, and the same principle applies here. Give it a second to load up the menu and let's say product line. For this one, again, selected value. And here we choose the product line. There we go. Comma, quotation marks, all product lines. There we go. Product line is already available. Uh -huh. Right an issue, product line title. You can even group these measures together afterwards if it's really necessary for you or if it helps you out. So for example, the way you do that is by opening up the relationship view, find the two measures that you just created, hold control to mark both of them and add them under a particular folder. So we name it title and now in the report view, you can see we have a folder specifically for those two measures. 
it's going to help out a lot as well if you have certain properties that are can be grouped. In one case, it kind of annoys me in certain cases because you have to expand on all the subfolders. But at the same time, it helps you to look where what's only important for you instead of what I have right now, just scrolling through 30 different columns, right? So we have those two elements already created. And now we're going to work with, actually, we can quickly test it beforehand. We don't need this one. We don't need bookmarks. So we can increase the size of the report. There we go. Don't need a Q&A visible. So what I'm going to have here is one card visual and another. I'm just testing out the values. I'm not really interested in design right now. So what I'm going to be doing is adding those two measures that I created, right? So we had regions for the donut. There we go. You can see it's all regions. For the combo, we have product line. There we go. We added. So we click on one of the regions. It showcases the selected value now. We choose vintage cars. The vintage cars is used as a selection right now. So we know that these two visuals work, right? Once we go back or once we clear the filters, all product lines, all regions. Perfect. Now, in order to create a master title measure, let's say like that, right? The actual title for the visual, for the report, we need to create another measure. And we're going to name it title for report. And we're going to use combined values. First, we need to define our delimiter. So what's going to be in between every single element? So we're going to use just a space in between, nothing too complex. Now, the next expression is to define how is your title going to be written. So right now we have two variables. We have all regions and all product lines. So what I can tell right here is my next expression is going to be, let's say, a sample sales report or we have this one. Now, comma, next item is going to be the reason for the donut. I'm going to use regions measure. So if we start to read it, sample sales report for, let's say, all regions by all product lines. So we can add by, comma, product lines title. There we go. Close it off. Now we have a longer measure here. And instead of using these two, I'm actually going to be using just one. And I already know that there's going to be issues with the size of the text. So I, I'm adjusting it. Disabling the category labels because we don't need that thing underneath it. And I'm going to be using title for report. So we can see sample sales report for all regions by all product lines. So if I click on this one, we can see sample sales report for EMEA by all product lines. Once I select also a product line, sample sales report for EMEA by trucks and buses or for bucks and trusses. My English is not that great today, let's be honest. <laughs> so this is also one of the things that allows you to create a report that actually looks and feels like an application. You create dynamic parts of the report that adjust based on every single selection. Um, for the back and zoom buttons, Maniraj, so for these visuals, these are the visuals by zoom charts. So that's just a built in feature for them. So if we go into the toolbars, zoom charts visuals have different elements. So we have back button, zoom out, reset button, dark mode, and so forth. So these are not available for native visuals. Regarding performance, do you know if it is smarter to make one measure for title or three measures like you just demonstrated, or is performance in development? Performance is always relevant. There's no such thing as irrelevant performance. <laughs> uh, but when it comes to the report, I would say it, again, depends on the report itself. If you have a really complex data model behind it, it's better to create one longer measure than instead of three simple ones. If it's a really simple measure, 
the reason why I actually create these as separate tabs is that I can reuse the same components into different elements, right? So essentially I separate them by component and then afterwards I can create those combined value titles essentially for almost every single visual. So I can make every single part of them to be dynamic. Um, we're actually utilizing this in different, let's say, cases as well. So for example, if we open up our website right here, I know that's a topic that nobody really likes to talk about. It's, it's old news, but we created a report about the coronavirus. And what we were doing here is essentially utilizing the same functions of combining different values. And that's why I had these sub elements, let's say like that. So what we were doing here is we're also utilizing the switch function. So for example, right now you can see that uh, the visual is showcasing confirmed cases. So it's gonna refer to both the donut and the map visual. And if I want to switch with it, I can click on that, for example, and this is gonna switch only these two elements right here, whereas everything else keeps the same. Um, but what I wanted to showcase right here is for example, the title that I'm using right here. So you can see right now by default, I haven't applied any filters, right? So I'm always showcasing the total, the total amount of cases in one way or another. As soon as I select something, and also right here, for example, you can see the whole display period. So starting from 22nd of January, ending with the 14th of September, that's when I have the last data for. As soon as I make a selection on a time series visual, for example, you can see that first, the titles for the visuals change. So now it says new registered cases per day currently displaying data for and that particular time period. And for all the visuals, instead of saying total cases, the titles now say filtered cases. So these small details is what really helps you to say, let's say, um, humanize the report so it makes it easier for them to read and find the relevant answers. Yeah. Uh, Right now, for me, that would be it. These are the main things uh, that I've covered. I have yeah. one, more, one more question. You just showed these dynamic titles, okay? The, the, for example, filtered cases there. Is that, is that as well the, a measure? Or is it uh, like a title of that visual itself? No, in all of these cases, what I'm doing is, I typically don't like to use built-in titles. I don't okay, know what's my problem understand. with them. <laughs> No, I, I just thought maybe there's an option to make dynamic titles as a built-in title. So, so it's not, so it's a, so it's a measure. Okay, that's fine. No, no, there, there is a way on how you can uh, do this also with the native visuals. So for example, if you just open up, um, let's do it right here, right? You can convert this to let's say a column chart. If you go into the formatting options, titles, you have a function right here. So you can choose, for example, whether it's the selected value or something like that, and you can reference a measure here as well. It's not really a problem. So for example, we can use right here, let's say regions, right? So I have a title, all regions. If I select one of them, it's gonna change accordingly. Should change accordingly. Doesn't, cool. I'm gonna test it out why it doesn't. But anyways, <laughs> you can do this with the built-in visuals as well. My problem typically with the titles uh, themselves is that they look a little bit clunky for me. And it's really hard to have, let's say, a consistent experience within all of them. I don't know what it is for me, but I just find it a little bit more difficult. I, it's more comfortable for me to actually create textual boxes, which I convert into specific uh, shapes, forms, colors, and so forth. All right, anybody has any other questions? Maybe something I didn't cover, something you didn't quite understand. I can easily go through it again if necessary. No, it looked uh, very great actually. Yeah, very good, to, very useful and uh, thank you. Yeah, thanks for finding the time to listen to me. <laughs> it's typically, you know, the main read kind of the question for every single lecturer is, well, we spent an hour here so was it worth it? That's the main thing. If it was worth for at least one of the actual attendees, then it was worth my time as well. Yeah, I wish thank you very much. So just to remind you that uh, uh, this recording will be available soon, tomorrow probably. 
Mm -hmm. So thank you very much. Really helpful and useful. And we hope to see you soon again. Yeah. Um, I'll also send you all these, the materials that I'm using. So those can be, I actually can put them in the comments as well for the meetup, right? So I could put links in the meetup comments so everyone can access them if necessary. And yeah, uh, one last thing from my side is that currently we're expanding a lot in Zoom charts. So if you are working with data visualization, BI report building, and you know currently are looking for some opportunities, I'm gonna post an email in the chat, which is for our CEO. Feel free to reach out to him and see what you can make it happen out of it. So we're looking for, let's say, not only senior developers or senior BI experts, we're looking for a different range of experts. So starting from, from people who can actually just, let's say, work on the report design themselves without actually working with the data. So the main responsibility is creating a report that look nice to going a little bit further to the people who can actually start to model the data, create the DAX calculated measures and so forth. Okay, so thank you very much again and have a nice evening for everyone. Yeah, thanks for having me and have a great rest of the day, everyone. Yep, thank you. Thank yep. you. Take care, bye.